Now, 70 traditional medicine experts from countries across Africa held a virtual meeting with WHO on the relationship but, or the role traditional medicine has, to, has in the COVID-19 response. They unanimously agreed that clinical trials must be conducted for all medicines in the region without exception. So on our guest today, we are welcoming uh, Professor Kum Awa, who is a medical anthropologist and uh, the university lecturer at the University of Yaoundé One. Hello, Prof, and welcome to the program. Thank you, uh, Gladys. So we've seen how when, when the uh, virus uh, outbreak started in the world, we've seen how um, tradi practitioners have carried out research to come up with a, a way of treating COVID-19 so how important has this been in the fight of COVID-19 when we talk about ethnomedicine? Uh, when we talk about ethnomedicine and the fight against COVID-19, it is very obvious uh, for the reason that at this stage there is no standard treatment for COVID-19. And everything that is being done now is based on ethnomedicine. Um, whether there are trials that they are trying to put out in the market there as clinical trials or there are clinical observations that are being made, all is grounded on ethnomedicine. And I would say that scientists, clinical scientists, have fallen back into nature to find out what is available there that can help in curing uh, the coronavirus. So um, those who had the knowledge of it and those who have tried, done some trials, merely go back to say, okay, what do I have on my shelf that I had tried in one virus that worked, that was similar to uh, the coronavirus that can work? Um, it is not only in Africa, you have that, that started as far back as when the Chinese started facing the challenge with COVID-19. They had to blend the Chinese traditional medicine and biomedicine to see if the two complementaries brought together could give them any answer. And I think it helped them to a point and it motivated other cultures which have similar uh, backgrounds like the Chinese, who first of all tend to um, medicines within their culture when they face a challenge like uh, COVID-19. So it is very obvious that in the confusion in which the world finds itself, the World Health Organization is the authority, the world authority that, cons that takes decisions about health. So to uh, set things straight, the World Health Organization was obliged to bring all parties together and tell them, well, let's set a standard on how things have to be done. And that is why um, the WHO Director General had to hold a meeting with uh, those who are using traditional medicine, as they call it, of course, medicine within a different culture, mm -hmm. which is different from biomedicine. Uh, to see what middle ground they can reach. And the only middle ground has to do with clinical trials, uh, different from clinical observations, because within the African country, or even with, uh, within China and India, what happens is that medicines are observed. When you start uh, administering them, you observe them before you come to a conclusion that the medicine works or it does not work. Exactly, like you're saying, they have to observe. But when these uh, tradit practitioners go to their archives and take out these drugs that they have used for other diseases that are similar to what we are experiencing now, without going through all the stages of a clinical trial, isn't this dangerous because not all uh, treatments for, like I will not say the Ebola vaccine can solve what we are facing now or like we see for the uh, Archbishop in Douala and even in Madagascar, I think those are, uh, the Artemisia is something that was already in the archives used to, 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 to solve or cure some diseases. Have they gone through all the stages of clinical trials? 
at the level of Africa they have gone through. Because as I said, within Africa, medicine, the work that medicine does on the body is observed. So does that mean that there is a difference or the, 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 number, the length to get a treatment when it comes to ethnomedicine and biomedics medicine is different? The length is different. Okay. The length is different. But the, th the, the, the difference is that there's observation in all the two. But the African or the Indian or the Chinese lay emphasis on clinical observation. They observe what happens. And they don't just take medicines by chance to start ingesting into their bodies. They try it as well as on animals. Or they take the animals into the bushes and see what the animal eats when it faces a particular problem. It's not for nothing that people keep pets. In every culture, it is on animals that those medicines, even food, is tested. People don't just eat food in our, in our context and in other contexts. They give it first to the dogs. If the dogs don't eat it or any other animal in the house does not eat it, then that food is not good for human consumption. So it's the same thing. You see, they went back into the archives, not only the traditional healers, clinical scientists, those who work on plants, microbiologists, uh, bo uh, ethno um, uh, botanists, uh, animal physiologists, they too have gone back and are trying these plants on animals to see whether they work. So traditional healers, as I say, have tried it and it works. So they turn around and say, okay, it's good for human consumption. And that's why you hear uh, the president of Madagascar saying clinical, I mean, uh, um, clinical observations have been made on the medicines that he's using, which is different from clinical trials, because mm -hmm. clinical trials go through six stages. In Africa, we need to uh, document those six stages, and then that is when we will say yes. But you see, when there is a pandemic, when the human being is overcome, he must look for everything to do to survive. Yeah. So what, um, what Archbishop Cleda has done, what Madagascar has done, India has done the same thing. The Chinese started it. It is a struggle to save lives in human communities. And you see, nothing goes for nothing. In the course of saving life, you lost lives. But then you come to a stage where you reach a balance and say, okay, this thing has worked, and this is how much I can learn from it and how much I can keep for future use. And that is when you find drugs being developed and accepted. Yes, it's safe. Even with clinical trials, they try at first in the, on samples in the, um, in the laboratory, then they try on animals, then they bring it to, uh, to human beings and start, start, start counseling toxicity, start seeing whether it is safe, start seeing whether it is uh, effective. And then at the last stage, they were accepted and they can use that particular drug for another one. And that is the same, that is, if you talk about the African scientists, specialists in African uh, medicine, yeah. if you talk about them in the sense that they have gone back to the archives, I think Professor Rao of France also went back to archives to see what hydrochloroquine could do. So it is a natural reflex in every so human society that when we face a problem, we must look for a solution. So Prof, what then exactly is the challenge with African countries promoting a traditional cures for COVID-19 without research? Um, I think this is an opportunity for African countries to accept themselves. It's a huge opportunity because at least they have an option. If somebody claims I'm able to treat this, call your scientists together. It's true, many African countries don't fund research, I mean financially per se, but this is a time that money should be put on the table to say scientists, yes, can you uh, try to tell us exactly what makes 
this medicine work. If we miss this opportunity, then we have missed an opportunity for centuries. The scientists who are in Pfizer, the scientists who are in GSK, you have many Africans there. You have African scientists who are borrowed or hired, consulted, to make many of the drugs that we take here in Africa when we are sick. So why not just say, this is an opportunity, let's provide some funding, rather than, because the whole thing is, there is also pressure from multinationals or pharmaceutical companies, because at the end there will be um, intellectual property rights. If it comes from Africa, then that African country owns it. But you know, it goes with a lot of cash. So I think an organization like uh, African Union should take that up, the Madagascar um, experience, the Cameroonian experience. I know we have many examples in Cameroon. Um, take it up and say, we accept. There's a research unit there. Can we pull together fine African scientists to have these medicines tested and put? If it means putting them in the world market or in the world um, context where clinical trials will be performed after the clinical observations in Africa, then Africa will come out of COVID-19 very strong. It may help us fight some of the poverty that we have because talking about medicines is talking about trillions. But, well, you know, uh, there are some fears that are being, people are afraid now. I want to find out from you what you're doing in your association that you belong. You know, people have claimed herbal medicines have kept them healthy or improved their symptoms or systems, but the bulk of research is inconclusive. You find a lot of, many people, Cameroonians, consuming a lot of ginger, garlic, lemon, and Experts fear that these uh, uh, there are possible side effects of this, and uh, many might lead to a cytokine storm. We've been heard of stories about a guy who died in the U.S. of prof uh, a profilated stomach because he took a lot of ginger and garlic. In your in your association, what are you doing to talk to people that it, they shouldn't do this in excess? You see, all food is medicine. And any medicine that you take to excess will become harmful. And every medicine has the toxic aspect of it. Um, so what we do is to talk to people and reach out to them and say, but take these things with a lot of limitations. It's not the first time that uh, people have been trying to use this for common flu and uh, uh, other diseases people have taken these particular uh, products or herbs. So herbal medicine is part of uh, the global global cure for disease. It's not only in Africa that it is taken. In fact, naturopathy forms part of global health. And that's why you have a department in the World Health Organization only on traditional medicine. And that is why the World Health Organization uh, Director General had to convene that meeting because they think traditional medicine has a contribution to make, but then it has to be regulated to a point. And those who, are, who practice uh, that type of medicine need to be regulated. And then uh, some evidence is really needed, like the evidence which uh, uh, Archbishop Kreda is claiming that he has cured many people. Some that have even testified. Uh, some have testified. That is already qualitative evidence. We need quantitative evidence. And of course, sampling of sampling testing and then seeing how it really works. And that is why I say resources should be put together so that that gigantic project can start. But start even at a smaller scale and then go to a bigger scale and we'll stand to gain. Thank you very much, Professor Awakum, for your insights. Once again, we hope to have you for more programs on CRTV News. Thank you very much, Gladys, and look forward to seeing you again. All right. Yeah.
Let's take a breather and we'll be back. <laughs> 